1 Peter chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. So put away all malice and all deceit and hypocrisy and envy and all slander. Like newborn infants long for the pure spiritual milk that by it you may grow up into salvation if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. As you come to him, a living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God chosen and precious, you yourselves like living stones are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For it stands in scripture, Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone, chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. So the honor is for you who believe, but for those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. They stumble because they disobey the word as they were destined to do. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh, which, which wage war against your soul. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable, so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray together, friends. Jesus, we are so grateful that we worship a living God. That every time you, you call us to gather in this place on the day that you have set apart for our souls to find rest, that you are faithful to meet us here, to prepare even this space for us, this time for us, so that as we gather together in obedience to your call, we would taste and see something marvelous. We are hungry for more of you, Lord. And what we're asking for this morning is nothing less than that. Jesus, we ask in your name for you to send your Holy Spirit, that you'd feed our souls, and that, Lord, we would leave overflowing with rivers of water that others can drink from because we know you and because we're known by you. So all things that are in the way, all distractions, all the cares of the world that would keep us, Lord, from our, our heart's desire. We ask that today you would do a mighty work of removing them from our hearts and minds and that you would leave us with one pure and holy passion. In the matchless name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. So I hate to bring up COVID-19. We haven't talked about this in a while, but we're, we're, I'm gonna bring it up simply for the reason of the lessons, right? The COVID-19 lockdown taught us a lot of valuable lessons. And for me, one of those lessons was about cravings and not cravings in general, but specifically with regard to what you see on the screen here, chocolate chip cookies. You see, my daughter Eva, though she is a young adult, she's actually a grandmother that's stuck in a young adult's body because all she wants to do is bake and fatten us up. And that's what she chose to do during the COVID lockdown. She would literally, without exaggeration, bake cookies every day. And if you've not had one of Eva's home-baked cookies, I'm not sure you know what it is to live. It is delicious. You cannot resist the temptation with the smell that goes through the house. It is absolutely delicious. Now listen, before COVID-19, I was in pretty good shape. 6'2", 185 pounds. I enjoyed long walks on the beach, sailing and time with friends. Just kidding, just kidding. But I was 185 pounds. Now, after a year of eating chocolate chip cookies, let's just say that I got a little heavier. I put on 30 pounds. I was 215 pounds. I, was, I hadn't been 250 pounds since college. In college, I was a truck. I was more of a Twinkie at this point. 
right? So it's a little, to quote one of our youth leaders, Gabe, who very graciously bought me a piece of exercise equipment because he was watching online and he said, I started to look fluffy. You believe the audacity of Gabe Nino Nuevo, just in case you were wondering who exactly said that to me. But Gabe, he made it all right. He got me something which was very nice, and it helped me to make a change. Now, here's the, here's, here's the point, right? During the COVID lockdown, I had actually trained my cravings to want what was actually bad for me. Now, listen, chocolate chip cookies are delicious, but if you feast on chocolate chip cookies all the time, you actually become addicted to sugar. Sugar is a huge problem in our culture, friends, a huge problem. That's a discussion for another day. But when you become addicted to sugar, what ends up happening is you're, you're craving the thing that gives you this high, but then you come crashing back down and you feel lethargic and depressed, and then you want the very thing that makes you feel horrible. And you get stuck in this cycle. What's the only way out? The only way out, friends, is sacrifice. You have to retrain your cravings, and the best and most effective way to do that is together. I had to say no to my addiction to sugar. I had to actually start exercising again, so diet and exercise. I had to make decisions to go to bed earlier so that I could get sleep, and I had to do it in community, which is what this picture is of a week ago in the gym that we built right after the COVID lockdowns in my garage. Because you see, friends, it was going to take a lot of sacrifice to get 30 pounds off of this frame. But thanks be to God, they're gone. May they never come back. Amen? <laughs> Amen. So what's the point? The point is not to talk about working out today, right? The point is to talk about the reality that the same principle when it comes to our physical strength and health, the same principle applies to our spiritual strength and health. That we so often are addicted to the very things that actually undermine our health and our strength. What are those things in your life? And why has God brought you here this morning? That's where we're going as we continue in this study. Where we've been is simply this, that Peter is writing to a people that are scattered and hopeless. The persecution just continues to increase. They continue to see friends lose their lives, let alone their freedoms and their joys. And they're wondering, is this really going to work out the way God said it's going to work out? How are we supposed to find hope in a world that is desperately broken? And Jesus, and through Peter, roots his people in this one reality. We have a living hope. A hope that cannot be killed. You know how we know that it cannot be killed? Because they already tried and lost. Amen. Because Jesus died and rose again. And our hope is in that resurrection. It is anchored behind the curtain. It is where the place of God's presence was in the temple. He's saying, we're going to heaven no matter what happens in this world. And that new world, that home for which we crave, is ours already. Therefore, it does not matter what happens to you in this world. You can stand by faith with hope, with a Assurance that you know the beginning from the end. That is excellent news. We call it good news because of the, the Greek word euangelion, but I prefer excellent news because it's way better than what we consider good. Amen? Amen? Last week we talked about this idea of rooting your hope fully in this reality that we are fully redeemed, that Jesus has done it all. Or to put it differently, that there's nothing that you can do or have done that can keep you from what he has won for you. Which is first and foremost, not a bunch of stuff in another dimension, but himself breaking into this world and then bringing us to our true and lasting home. Nothing you have done. You are fully redeemed in Christ for all of your sins, past, present, and future. Hallelujah. 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 Today, here's where we're going. Here's our theme. We must learn to long for what actually satisfies. We must learn to long for what actually satisfies. Two points, unnatural addictions and learn to long for Holy Spirit. So first, unnatural addi ad addictions. Verse 1 in our passage starts with this word, so... So what he's, it's like, therefore, it's looking back. So to, to put it differently, as fully redeemed individuals, therefore, put away all of these things. Malice, deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and slander. Why? 
because of what we just talked about. Because these are the things that we get addicted to. You're like, wait a second, we get addicted to these things? How does that even work? I don't want, I don't like evil. I don't like malice, really. You don't, there's never been a time when you've intentionally done something wrong because of the feeling that it gives you. Because of the rush that it gives you. You've never deceived because of the thrill of getting away with it. Hypocrisy is like deceit, but it's, it's pretending to be something or someone that you're not. Didn't we just talk about that last week? How as a culture, that's exactly what we're actually encouraged to do and to be? Envy, jealousy, this, this idea that I, I want what you have and I, I should be able to, to take it from you or I deserve it more than you do. Slander, the backbiting that happens when envy's in the room. Do you see how often these things are a part of our lives, but we dismiss them and we push them aside? And it's simply because we don't pay attention to this rush that happens inside of us. We downplay it as if somehow that's not there. When it is, friends, it's like sugar in our bodies. We are high on the adrenaline of rebellion. Let me say that one more time so you don't miss it. We get high on the adrenaline of rebellion. I'll give you two examples, because we've got our younger kids in a, with us this morning, and so I'm going to speak to two school examples in my own life. One was when I was in fifth grade. I did not like my fifth grade teacher, and he did not like me. It's hard to believe, I know, I know. Um, but one of the things he was really, he'd get really upset about is if he caught you chewing gum in class. You know what I did every day for like a month? When it was like 15 minutes left in the day, I would shove so much gum in my mouth that I couldn't even talk just because I wanted to rebel. And you know when that ended? The day that he confronted me about something else and I couldn't defend myself, you know why? Because I couldn't talk, I had too much gum in my mouth. So I just stayed silent and I realized the very thing that I thought was giving me joy and pleasure and freedom and whatever, it had backfired into me getting into even more trouble than I would have gotten into in the first place. Same thing in middle school. In middle school, I made a habit of cutting my Italian class. Why? Because I had a box full of candy that I wanted to sell to all the kids who were in study hall. Listen, I was an entrepreneur. That's how you do, right? Like, you're from Congress, you make your way, right? But I was cutting class because, and then I, I ran into my professor, Mr. Champoli, who loved me. And with tears in his eyes, he says, Guglielmo, where have you been? And it broke my heart. Because you see, I thought I was getting freedom and I was becoming this, my own self by cutting class when what I was really doing was cutting away the self that others could see and I couldn't. Do you see? See, the, the point is simply this. The problem with us going after these unnatural addictions is we actually wage war on ourselves. That's what Peter says in our passage. It's not simply wrong, but it's self destructive. It never gives us what it claims to give us. So the prideful rebellion in our hearts, think of it like sugar in your body. It feels good in the moment. That's why we do it. It tastes good in the moment. That's why we eat it. But when we do that very thing, it actually produces the opposite effect in us. It doesn't produce life. It steals from life. It doesn't give freedom. It enslaves. So think of it like this, putting twinkly, Twinkies in your Tesla. Tesla is like the cool in vogue. It's the thing to, to do and to drive. Everyone cool has a Tesla, right? So could you imagine buying your Tesla so that you are like the man or the woman now, and you've got your thing, and then you take your Tesla, which is supposed to be charged with electricity, and you plug it right into that Twinkie, and you're so excited because the next day you're going to take your Tesla out for a drive. You think it's going to work? Of course it's not going to work. In fact, if you keep trying that, who knows what's in Twinkies? No one, so put your hands down, okay? <laughs> Those things are not natural. They're not good for you, don't eat them, right? But if you plug your Tesla into a Twinkie and you just kept doing it, you know what's gonna happen to your Tesla? It's not gonna work anymore. It's not just not gonna get charged, you're going to break it. Hence, futile and destructive. It doesn't give what it promises. When you think malice or evil, why do we do things that are intentionally evil. Well, it's because of the rush of rebellion, which we call control. I want to be in control, and so I rebel against God or against this authority in my life. And you know what happens? Does control actually give you what you're deeply desiring? When you choose control, which is the way of pride, 
underneath that control is a deep desire to be what? Safe. When you choose control through rebellion, or to put it differently, when you live by the sword, you then die by the sword. When you choose control, are you safer or less safe? Do you see? Same thing when it comes to deceit, the rush of manipulation. I've deceived someone. I'm living in this state of hypocrisy. They're believing that something that isn't true is true, and guess what? It's still not true. And so when you choose the way of deceit, you're actually wanting to be seen. You're actually wanting to be loved. But when you produce someone that's actually not you, guess who isn't loved and seen? You. Same thing when it comes to envy, the rush of superiority. You're saying, that person has that good thing, and I should have that. I should need that. I should be the one who gets that, not that person. You're jealous over what they have, and guess what you produce when you go after envy and you allow it to grow in your heart? Are you actually a better version of yourself and therefore better than them? Or are you chipping away and corrosively eating away at the heart that makes you whole? Do you see how it doesn't give you what it promised? It is the lie from the beginning. When the serpent said to Adam and Eve, God's holding back on you. He knows that if you eat this one fruit from this one tree, that you'll be like him, and he doesn't want that. Here's the reality, friends. God had already made them like him. When the serpent said, you should eat the, tree, the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil so that you'll be like God, you know what they should have said back? We already are. He's already made us like him. So we're not going to fall into your temptation. But they did, and we do all the time. And when they ate of that tree, did it make them more like God? Or did it actually mar the image of God in them and trap them in this futile cycle of self-destruction? Do you see the difference? Do you see your own story? It's one thing to listen to this, to laugh along with us, and to wrestle along with us in general. It's quite another, friends, to allow that Holy Spirit who's been speaking to you this whole time to actually engage him to allow him in. Are you? Will you? He's brought you here because there are places where you are plugging your Tesla into Twinkies. And it's not working. He wants you to be honest about that. Will you listen? Will you ask? He's not asking you to shame you. He's asking you so that he can help you find the power, the life you've been looking for. When we get stuck in this pattern, we live what the, the writer of Proverbs talks about in Proverbs chapter 26, verse 11, when he says, like a dog returning to its own vomit, so a fool returning to his folly. We get stuck in this cycle, and it feels grosser and grosser. And we think we're the gross ones. We're unredeemable. We're not going to change. The good news is for someone else. There's no hope for me. Beloved, if that is your story this morning, can you please hear me say to you, this scripture was written 2,000 years ago to a people who struggled just like you, and just like me. And God wants you to hear your story in his story because that's where we find hope. Not sort of hope, not a, I really hope, certainty, guaranteed certainty because we have a living hope. And his name is Jesus which is our second point. We need to learn to long for Holy Spirit. 
Verse 2, it says, instead, learn to, to crave or to long for what it says is pure or genuine or unadulterated milk. Like a baby that thirsts for its mother's milk, we are to learn to thirst for Holy Spirit in a way that satisfies our deepest cravings. Why is that? Well, he gives us a, a hint here. It's translated in our text, spiritual milk. Long for spiritual milk. The word is not spiritual. The Greek word is logikos, which is where we get logical. So it's a good and right translation to put spiritual there. You know why? Because that is logical. That is what we were made from, like a baby that's made from its own mother. We were made from, for, and with, and by the Holy Spirit, which is exactly what you see the story of Scripture tell us. God made us in His image. The only reason why we exist is why? Because God wanted to love us. So please hear that freshly this morning. You're only on this planet you only exist for one primary reason. It's because God wanted you. Not some version of you, not us in general, but specifically and uniquely you. There's no other you. God wanted you, which is why he made you. And he wanted you to share in his love. And here's the craziest part. As you share in his love and as you share in his person, that love gets richer and fuller for others to share in as well. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So God makes us because he loves us, but he says he made us out of the dust of the earth, but the only way we actually became animated, the only way we actually became alive is when God breathed his spirit, his ruach, into our nostrils, right? So we are made of the Holy Spirit. You following? Then in Ezekiel chapter 37, when he gives this picture through the prophet Ezekiel of a world that has been decimated, because of its addiction to sin. He says to Ezekiel, can these bones live? And Ezekiel says, Lord, only you know. And then he gives him a vision of the Spirit of God blowing into these bones, and they start to rattle, and then they get up, and they have sinews and muscles and skin, and it's a picture, a foretaste of what the resurrection glory is going to look like. But don't miss it. What's the essential po uh, uh, ingredient? The essential ingredient is what? Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit is the one who breathes life and resurrection life into dead and hopeless things. It's the same message that Jesus gave as he was talking to Nicodemus at night. And Nicodemus asked, how do we inherit the kingdom of heaven? And Jesus says, you must be born again. And Nicodemus is like, well, I'm supposed to go back into my mother's body? Wrong. You must be born again, not of water, but of spirit. The spirit of the resurrection. Or as Paul puts later, the same spirit that rose Jesus Christ from the dead is the same spirit that is inside of you. And so as you learn to walk by the spirit, you will live. But if you live according to the flesh, you will die. We were made to live on. We actually crave and thirst for, in the deepest recesses of our soul, Holy Spirit, his presence, his love, all of his fruit, all of his power, we were made to know. And God says, like newborn infants, learn to long for this milk. The next logical question is, how? Right? How do we do this? It's super complicated. Here's the process. As we come to him, he fills us. Did I hear a hallelujah? hallelujah? Hallelujah, right? Like, it's not super complicated. It's not some, figure out this math equation, then go on this quest, find this treasure, and then maybe if you make it to the top of the mountain, then you get nirvana, and you arrive, and then God gives you his Holy Spirit. Wrong. Here's what he says. You've been addicted to sugar. Stop eating sugar. Turn and start eating stuff that's healthy for you. Stop putting sugar in your milk. Who here puts sugar in your milk? Okay, we'll have a conversation later about that. But the, the idea here what, is what? We're made for pure Holy Spirit. And what we so often do is we add to him the things we think we need, the additives, the additions, the side dishes that actually take away from who he is and what he provides in our lives. But Peter says here, as we come to him, the living stone, 
We, like living stones, are being built up into a Holy Spirit house together that here we can minister. Translation, all he requires is that we turn. The, the word we're used to hearing there is repent. Turn, it's a spatial, turn back to him. Just come to him and he will provide all that you need. It's not rocket science. It's not requiring anything other than completely dying to your ability and your right to be in control. Do you see what I did there? You guys were really excited about how simple it was, and then all of a sudden it got real. It is as simple as turning, but it's not ever as simple as that, is it? Because there's a reason why we keep going after these other things. It's because we're addicted. We're addicted, which is why God says we do this together. Everywhere you see the word you in your passage this morning, read y'all. It's plural. He's not saying you do this individually wrong, because you know why we can't? We can't. We can't do it individually. We won't do it individually. That's not how he's designed it. As we turn to him, our living stone, he will build us up together into a house for Holy Spirit to live in. And as Holy Spirit lives in us, it will change the way we do life because we will finally begin to have our deepest desires satisfied which is what he then talks about in verses 9 to 10. He says, this is who we were made to be. He says, you're a chosen race. I want you to hear the deep desires of love and value there. You're chosen. You're not a mistake. You're not an afterthought. I see you, and I love you. You are valuable to me. You're a royal priesthood. You have purpose. You've been designed for something greater than yourself and yourselves. And as we live into that purpose, we will find greater freedom and hope and joy. You're a holy nation, an affirmation that what we're doing in Christ is good. Well done, good and faithful servant. The deep desire of hearing that well done. A people for his own possession. Here again, that deep desire to be loved. Man, there's a reason why all of us are looking for love. Looking for love in all the wrong places, right? There's a reason why these songs resonate with us because we always look for love in the wrong places. Why do all of us look for love? Because we were made for him. Love has a name. It is Yahweh, or as we sang earlier, Yahweh Elyon, the Lord Most High. Yahweh Elyon is our maker. He is our redeemer. He is our friend, and he is the lover of our souls. We were made to know his love. A people of mercy, which is another way of simply saying, you don't get what you deserve. I see you in your weakness. I see you in your rebellion. I see you in your mistakes. So pause for a second and think about the very thing we just talked about before when we said, will you let the Holy Spirit speak to you about those things that are going on in your life, the sugar that you're adding to your milk, the Twinkie that you're plugging your Tesla into, wherever that is, I want you to hear the Lord say to you, you are a people of mercy. I see you, and I don't give you what your sins deserve. You are safe. And for the rest of your life, you get to be a testimony to his mercy. We have so many examples of that in our lives and in the scripture. And I want to point you to one of them today. David, when, when he is, been, he's been anointed king, but he's actually not become king yet. Saul is still king. And Saul is chasing David all over God's green earth trying to kill David. And David had just escaped Saul and he, had, he ran to uh, Abimelech, the, the high priest at Nob, and he was trying to get this, the show bread because his men were starving. Do you remember that? The bread of the presence. And then it says that Saul comes in and basically annihilates every, every priest there, slaughters them all. And David is so distraught that he then runs. He flees. Or to put it differently, he turns. And he runs to the Philistines, his enemies, and specifically to the city of Gath. Who was from Gath again? Do you remember? Oh, Goliath, the giant that David slew. He runs to the hometown of his biggest enemy, 
who he just cut off his head as they're killing him with a, a stone and a sling. He runs to the place where logically makes no sense. But hear this. David was a man after God's own heart. And he kept facing deeper and deeper persecution. He's probably wondering the same thing that we do in those moments. What the heck, God? I'm following you with my whole heart. And my life is falling apart. I'm watching people die around me. Where are you? And what are you doing? And it's at that very moment that every one of us is tempted to turn away from God and to run after something that is less than God. To run after, in this particular case, control, safety, security, and something less than God. Do you remember how the rest of the story goes? He's in front of King Achish, and he has an aha moment when he realizes, I'm in deep doo-doo. They're about to kill me. I should not have come here. The promise, the rush of I'm running to go find help, I got there and I realized, ah, it's giving me the opposite. I'm in big trouble. And so David be, pretends to be insane. He pretends to be gone. He lets spittle come down his beard. He starts acting all funny. And, and, the king, and King Achish looks at him and says, are there not enough madmen in Gath already? Send him out of my, my sight. And he runs, and David runs away. And he writes this song. I sought Yahweh, and he answered me. Pause. What is he saying? I turned back. And I ran to him. He didn't say, I fixed everything. He didn't say, I made a, a, amends for my issues. I simply turned. And he answered me and delivered me from all my fears. Listen to this. Those who look on him are radiant and their faces shall never be ashamed. What did David just do? He just had spittle coming down his beard. He was nothing, he was not radiant at all. He was completely humiliated and shamed. But he's saying, now all I did was turn and seek God, and now his face shall never be ashamed. This poor man, David, cried to the Lord, and the Lord heard him and saved him out of his troubles. Listen, the angel of the Lord, Jesus, in the Old Testament, encamps around those who fear him and delivers them. Oh, taste and see. Do you hear it? Pure spiritual milk. Oh, taste and see that Yahweh is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. Do you hear David singing the truth of what Peter is now proclaiming to this persecuted church? We were made for pure, unadulterated, Holy Spirit milk. And when we choose to run after other things, whether completely or to mix together, it only ever works against us. But even when we've done that, the same thing is required. It's as simple as turning and seeking. Seek my face, you have said, O Lord. O Lord, your face do I seek. The invitation for us this morning is to come, friends, to come and to watch as he fills us with his spirit, as he satisfies our deepest desires, because in case you missed it, the deep desires for love, for security, for peace, for hope, they should all sound like something to you, the fruit of the spirit, because they are the fruit of the spirit. They're only ever satisfied in him. And here's the good news, friends. You already have him in Jesus. Your deepest desires are already fulfilled in Jesus. You're not waiting for anything. You don't have to say, God, if you love me, you'll give me. No, we already have all we need for life and godliness. Look back to the garden. Hey, if, if God simply gave you permission to come to this tree, you'd be like him. We already are. It's the same lie, it's the same trap, and it's the same opportunity for us today to realize that in Christ, we already have the Holy Spirit. And because we have him, Holy Spirit, 
we already have all we need for life and godliness. It doesn't mean we don't grow. It doesn't mean we don't mature. It simply means God's not holding anything back. God's not the dad up in the sky who's just waiting until we kind of figure it out and then he'll give us what we need. Wrong. He's already given all, all that we need because he loves us and he wants us to turn and to learn to walk like that's true. Question for you this morning. What are your Twinkies? Where are you plugging your Tesla let me rephrase that. Where are you plugging his Tesla? Because that's what you are. Into Twinkies. Rather than being filled with the Holy Spirit. Where are you adding some Twinkie to a little electricity thinking it's going to make it better when all you're doing is making it worse? Where is he inviting you this morning to first of all admit that but then secondly, to turn and taste and see freshly just how good he is. He's not looking to shame us. Did you hear David's words? Those who look on him are radiant. They will never be put to shame. Radiant. Because when we look at him, his glory reflects off of our faces. And that is precisely what we were made for. Him. Him. And friends, that's precisely what we have in Jesus. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you that you are so much better than Twinkies. Thank you that you provide safe space for us, God. That we can be honest about the places where we have been addicted to sin. Addicted to the things that make promises and never actually satisfy. Addicted to the places where we can rebel against you and feel the rush of being in control, of living in deceit, and yet all the while, Lord, it's working against us. Willingly and unwillingly, Lord, many of us are stuck. And you've shown us that this morning. And I praise you that you are the light of the world, that you shine into the darkness because you want to bring freedom and healing and wholeness that you expose us not to shame us, but to cover us with a better covering, with your finished work and the freedom to admit our sins and to be forgiven, to be cleansed, to be made whole. And so, Abba, I pray right now in the matchless name of Jesus Christ that as you have brought conviction through Holy Spirit's work in us this morning, that you would now also bring comfort, that you would console, Lord God, and that you would renew, that you would make us new. Thank you, God, that that is exactly why you came. It's why you walked in our shoes, and it's why we have nothing to fear in admitting that we have been plugging our Tesla into Twinkies. You are so much better. We were made for pure Holy Spirit milk. We pray that, Lord Jesus, you would help us to taste and see, to drink deeply today, even as in your perfect timing, you have brought us to your table. We praise you in Jesus' name.